Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again, to Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the 18th day, right, Anna? Yes. Yeah, today is the 18th day of the last month we are in, the, of the 12th month of the year 2019, dear brothers and sisters. Today, I'm here once again to help our 10 year old daughter. And Messiah wants her to share three very urgent visions and two urgent words which Messiah gave once again and we pray over every visions and words dear brothers and sisters as the Lord leads us that's how we share once again and Lord Messiah Lord Jesus Christ is his message is consistent once again today please keep an eye that what he is telling for his bride what is the message about his return the message is consistent that his return is soon and very soon and as a matter of fact Messiah says it is imminent and Messiah says be ye ready for his bride. Oftentimes we are confused with because we are in the last of the last of the last moments dear brothers and sisters. Satan will try everything to confuse us, whether it's walking by sight, whether it's walking in flesh, whether it is dishonoring our Lord, our God, our Savior, our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, whether it is distrusting Him, whether it is relying on our understanding of fleshly understanding of things, whatsoever the means or mode be, it is ultimately a confusion. It is ultimately the confusion which which Satan wants to create in these last of the last moments, dear brothers and sisters. When we see confusion, there will be contention. And when we when we see confusion and con contention, we need clarity. We need clarity because curiosity won't help. We need a formal commitment to the word of God, not carnality, but Christ. Only the word of God, only the word of God can shed light in these last moments dear brothers and sisters the choice is ours whether we are going to trust our flesh or what we hear or what we see or run after the tangibility or listen to lord jesus christ and what he is telling in about his return that our faith is about to become sight. It is time to be excited dear brothers and sisters it's not time to be divided it's not time to be Get, giving into the confusion or contention. It is time to be filled with his goodness. It is time to be lost in his love. It is time to look up. It is time to praising our Savior all the day long, all the day long in its true sense. It is time to ask the Lord, fill me with your joy so that your joy overflows. I am super saturated. I get super saturated with your joy so that it spills over to all my fellow brethren, all our fellow brethren. Have we prayed that lately, dear brothers and sisters? When we see first John, first John chapter one, the book of first John is a staggering, staggering, staggering book, dear brothers and sisters. If you haven't lately gotten a chance to dwell on it, there is so much going on which is exactly written. We see right in front of our eyes, unfolding. When we think about prophecy, we think about wars and famines and all the seismic activities, volcanic activities. That's just one part of it. And that's not even the major part of the prophecy, end time prophecies, dear brothers and sisters. The major part of end time prophecy we will find in book of first John. We will find in book of first Peter and second Peter, mostly second Peter, book of Jude. Messiah's end time briefings that's where we will find the major part of these end time especially book of first John is a book dear brothers and sisters if you haven't revisited lately please do pray over we highly implore you please do go for it and please take some time please ruminate on those please meditate and ruminate on those what John is recording in first in the book of first John the epistle of first John so as he starts he says the first four verses he says the title given is what was heard seen and touched he says that that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our 
hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and, and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard we declare to you. Why? That you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full, dear brothers and sisters. When we, as we were looking in the book of 1 Peter, we are in the 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15, still of course there, we see the imperative for apologetics that we are ready to witness when Messiah calls us to be His witnesses. When some Christians, some true born again believer hear this word, they start worrying. They worry that they need exceptional skills or they need to get equipped going to understanding the Bible all through and, and or having some exceptional charisma in order to share the good news with others. Yet, yet, as we see in 1 John chapter 1, the first four verses, yet to witness is not to merely speak. Of the plan of salvation to someone. That's what we understand from the first four verses. Because the word witness literally means to see, hear or know by personal presence and perception. To testify, bear witness to, give or afford evidence of. It's just not about a head knowledge. It's about the personal Perception. How personally are we touched by Lord Jesus Christ which we share. When John wrote that he was sharing what he had experienced first hand. It is not about parenting words dear brothers and sisters. It's a first hand experience which John was sharing as we saw in the first four verses. He was saying I am full of joy because of the experience of knowing Messiah. And I want to invite you to share in that joy. He was not offering them a one-time deal. He was not offering them the one-time smartphone single tap salvation. No, he was not. He was inviting them to the personal experience of sharing the joy of Jesus Christ. The joy of Jesus Christ. And that is a personal experience. When we are madly, when we are crazily in love with someone, dear brothers and sisters, we are so excited about the relationship and time spent together, aren't we? We always want to spend time with that person. It feels so good, aren't we? Likewise, when we are all out in love with our, madly in love with our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't keep to yourself the joy that comes from knowing Him. It spills over. Bearing witness and strengthening other believers. It is not the contention. It is not the doctrinal enforcement. But it is the joy of Jesus Christ. Which draws people to Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, as you give testimony of who God is. And how he is working in your life. It makes no difference whether you speak Quietly or with great exuberance, dear brothers and sisters, if you have gotten a chance or if you're contemplating, if the Spirit of God is leading you, but then you are feeling that I am not well equipped to talk in your workplace, wherever you are or wherever, to your friends or families, wherever you are. If you have, if the Spirit of God is leading you, leading you today to give you give the testimony of who God is and how he is working in your life it really makes no difference whether you speak quietly or with great exuberance you don't have to be a good orator if that's what the social media is teaching us or the modern pulpits is teaching us then please retract it's a red flag we don't have to why why? Because in their spirit whom we are witnessing true born again believers will pick up on the deep genuine gladness in our hearts that goes beyond natural happiness. Witnessing is not about words. Witnessing is all about the joy of Jesus Christ. 
Because it is a supernatural joy which goes beyond words. And people who don't yet know the Lord will find themselves hungering for the relationship which you have when you witness and share the joy of Jesus Christ, which is super saturating you every moment as you draw close every single day. We draw close to the fellowship in Lord Jesus Christ. And in that way, they will be drawn to his spirit in you. Witnessing is not a matter of eloquence or talent. It's an overflow of the personal relationship with Lord Jesus Christ that is conforming us to his image. As Romans 8 29 tells us, as we allow the Holy Spirit to increasingly express his life and power through us, contagious joy will be the fruit of his indwelling presence, dear brothers and sisters. It was never about good oration. Today is the day once again to be filled with his goodness, to be filled with his joy, super saturated with his joy. Today, as a matter of fact, Anna has a message for us as we see on screen. Today, we will be once again revisiting the Sanctum Sanctorum of New Testament, Kadosh Kadoshim, the Holy of Holies of the New Testament, John 17, as the Lord led Anna to start the the message series, the sermon series on John 17, I believe today, as we see on screen, she will be talking about John 17, 17. One verse which is going to change our entire outlook of a true born again believer's life. One verse, dear brothers and sisters, we highly implore you, please pay heed today. If time is your limiting factor, please pray over in flesh, dear brothers and sisters. In flesh, we understand once again, we won't be able to listen to one, one and a half hour. Dear brothers and sisters, please pray over. If time is your limiting factor, please do it in segments. However, but let the Spirit of God work in you. It was never about who is talking, what is talking, this channel or that channel. It is about Lord Jesus Christ. It was about Him. It is about Him. And it will always be about Him today. As a matter of fact, Hannah will share the as the Spirit of God has laid on our heart and solely once again led by the Ruach HaKodesh, led by the Spirit of the one true living God, that how the Spirit of God exactly works in a true born again believer's life. What is the role? And she will be sharing in brief. If you want to know more, once again, please do join us with our Discipleship 101 journey where every three weeks we meet on this virtual platform to understand more about our great commission please do pray over we do look forward all our fellow brethren for you to join us in our discipleship 101 journey please let us hold hands together to glorify him to know him through his word because this is eternal life to know him to know our heavenly father and our messiah yeshua hamashiach so today let us once again bow our heads, let us bow our hearts, and let's start with a short word of prayer so that Messiah's purpose can be accomplished during this time because his return is truly upon us, and let's hear what Messiah has for us. So let's bow our hearts and let's bow our heads and let's start with a short word of prayer. Shall we? Anna? Yes. All right. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We just praise you, we just praise you, we just praise you, Lord. We give you all the praise and power and honor and glory. Oh, Heavenly Father, today we stagger, we stagger, Lord, as we begin to embrace the extremes, incredible, unimaginable extremes that you have gone on our behalf that we might live. We thank you, Holy Father, that by thy grace and thy grace alone, God's riches at Christ's expense, you have called each one of us and not by any merit of our own, not by any merit of our own. We thank you, Father, that you have allowed your only begotten son, our King, our Lord, our Savior, our all in all, Yeshua HaMashiach. To purchase our liberty from the law. To purchase our redemption. Our access to you Lord. Father we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Ruach HaKodesh. That he is so diligent to open the scriptures. To the diligent to know more about you. We pray Father today. That if you would please increase in each one of us. In every single of our dear fellow brethren. As we bring all our dear brothers and sisters. In your presence we pray Lord. Please please. If you would increase in each one of us. Give us a new appetite. A renewed hunger Lord. For thee and thy word that we each may grow in thy grace and knowledge. In the grace and knowledge of our Lord. But also Father we each might be more discerning. More perceptive to what you precisely have for each one of us. 
in the days that remain, Lord. We thrill, Father, today as we discover in your word the exciting, exciting demonstrations of your precision and your love. And yet, Father, as we behold our horizon and we sense the urgency of the perilous times, Lord, we are living in, we do seek discernment, Father. We do seek discernment that we might know what it is you would have each one of us do, Lord. Because we do understand, Father, that the opportunity is not mandated that you have called each one of us, every single of our dear fellow brethren, to a specific task. Oh, Holy Father, today we pray that we pray, if you would, through your Holy Spirit, please make that evidently clear to each and every single of our dear fellow brethren, that in the days that remain, that in the days that remain, we might be each more fruitful and faithful stewards, Lord, of the opportunities you are presenting us with on this side of the eternity. And today, Father, once again, I bring Anna and myself in your presence and pray, Lord, today, please be our strength and our weakness as we anoint every alphabet which comes out of our mouth, Lord. Whatever is not from you, please let it not happen. Through us, it is impossible, Lord, but Matthew 19, 26 gives us the hope and strength that through you, everything, everything is possible. So we claim on Psalm 141, verse 3, Lord, and pray, Father, that please, please do set a guard over our mouth and keep watch over the door of our lips as we convey thy message Lord to thy appointed people and right this moment in the name of our coming and reigning King Yeshua HaMashiach using our authority of Luke 10 19 we bind every evil of the enemy which is coming at this time which is coming at this message at all our dear fellow brethren at all our dear brothers and sisters and we pray we pray for the hedge of protection for each one of us. And Father, once again, we pray that may this message reach to thy appointed people, Lord, to accomplish thy mighty will. And please, please do enlighten the hearts and minds of all our dear fellow brethren through your Holy Spirit, Lord, to understand what you precisely have for each one of them through this message. All this we pray in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Our Messiah indeed. Amen, amen and Amen and Amen. All right, you can please go ahead, Anna. So on the 30th day of the 11th month of this year, 2019, I heard the Lord say, My child, this is the time of my coming. Be in my presence at all times. My children, as my word says, do not be deceived. Deception fills the air. Do not give it to the lies of the enemy. And on the first day of the 12th month of this year, 2019, I heard the Lord say, My child, I am with you. I love you with an everlasting love. And my grace is sufficient for you. My child, my return is imminent. And until I come, tell my people to abide in me and follow me. I will lead you and guide you. Shalom. And coming to the visions which the Lord wanted us to share, the first one was on the 29th day of the 11th month of this year, 2019, and I saw a white background. On this background, I saw the words, I am coming, written in yellow and golden 3D letters. Below it, I saw the words, very soon, written in pink and purple, shining letters. Below that, I saw a cross, and below that, I saw the words, be ready, in pink and blue letters. And below that, I saw the words, it is imminent, written in shining purple letters. And that was the end of the vision. The second one was on the 30th day of the 11th month of this year, 2019. And I saw a golden throne. Below it, I saw the words, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, written in blue. And that was the end of the vision. And the last one was on the first day of the 12th month of this year, 2019. And I saw a background of a blue sky and a dove. Below the dove, I saw the words, Christ is coming, written in purple. And below that, I saw the words, be ready, written in a greenish blue color. And that was the end of the vision. So today we see that Lord Jesus Christ is once again reminding us that he is coming soon and extremely soon to take Saul home. And while we wait, Lord Jesus Christ is once again reminding us to be in his presence and be ready. Today when we look around, we see so much of darkness and deception everywhere. We see a completely dark, God-hating world. Where do we find strength in the midst of such a world? Today, let's revisit John chapter 17 to understand where Lord Jesus Christ 
drew his strength from in his last moments. John chapter 17 is the longest recorded prayer of Christ in scripture. And it is basically Lord Jesus Christ's prayer before he left the disciples. We have previously looked at verses 1 through 5, then at verses 6 through 8, then at verses 9 through 13, and last time at verses 14 through 16. In John chapter 17, the words glory and glorify are used eight times altogether. The phrase whom you have given me occurs seven times in reference to the disciples and all true believers. Seven times it is implied that Christ wasn't and now we aren't of the world. Seven separate times it is implied that Christ was and now we are only in the world. We don't belong to it. Moreover, we see the word the words I have used repeatedly throughout this chapter. We also see the words you have used repeatedly in this chapter. These are some of the features of John chapter 17. Now by way of review, in our first lesson, we learned about Lord Jesus Christ's plea for glorification about what Christ had accomplished on earth and what he thought of his cross. We looked at verses 1 through 5. In our second, we looked at verses 6 through 8, and we looked at how the disciples knew that Lord Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah. In our third, we looked at verses 9 through 13, and we looked at what the world is to a true believer, to one who has been truly born again. And last time, in verses 14 through 16, we looked at what it really means for a true believer not to be of the world what we learn about it from Christ himself, and how a believer should live with regards to the world. This time we are going to look at verse 17, and we will learn more about the sanctification ministry of the Holy Spirit, and about the Word of God, and how they are linked together. Before we jump in, we remember that John chapter 17 can be divided into three parts. Christ's prayer for himself, verses 1 through 5, Christ's prayer for the eleven, verses 6 through 19, and Lord Jesus Christ's prayer for all true believers, verses 20 through 26. So we are basically in Lord Jesus Christ's prayer for his eleven disciples who were with him at that time, because Judas Iscariot had already left by that time. Last time we left off at that place where Lord Jesus Christ declares that his followers are not of the world because he wasn't. And continuing from there, in verse 17, Lord Jesus Christ prays, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So what is Lord Jesus Christ trying to say here? It seems like a very simple verse. Basically, Lord Jesus Christ's petition that the Father would sanctify true believers by his word, the ultimate truth. That is a correct understanding of the verse from the surface, but if we go deeper, we will see that it leads us to understand more about the Holy Spirit, sanctification, and the Word of God. So let's understand what this verse is telling us. We are talking about the sanctification ministry of the Holy Spirit. So in order to understand this, we need to first understand who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. He's a person. He's God. We understand from the scripture that we serve a three in one God, not three different gods, but one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. The word Trinity comes from the Latin tria or tris, meaning three. We get a picture of the Father from the Old Testament, a picture of the Son from the New, although both are all across the scriptures, but we get a bit clearer view of the Father from the Old Testament and of the Son from the New. But many of us today, even as true believers, don't understand much about the Spirit of God. So let's take a look at some scriptures which tell us about the Spirit of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 tells us, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Psalm chapter 51 verses 11 and 12 tells us, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 tells us, 
the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not try out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Matthew chapter 10 verses 19 and 20 tells us, But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Luke chapter 11 verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? John chapter 14 verses 16 and 17. And I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. John chapter 15 verse 26. But when the helper comes whom I shall send to you from the father, he will testify of me. John chapter 16 verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 9. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 23. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, 
who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So hopefully we understand from these scriptures that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just some force or air or something without substance. He's invisible to us in this flesh, but he's a person. And he possesses all the attributes of God because he is God, being the third person of the Trinity. Our fleshly minds can't wrap around the fact that even though he's a real person, he actually lives inside us and lives inside every true believer. We can't understand that because it's wholly supernatural. But what we do understand is that the Holy Spirit is a person and he has a ministry in every true believer. And that's what we're going to look at next. Sanctification. We have often talked about three tenses of salvation. Justification, which was done at the cross of Calvary. We can call it as being saved from the penalty of sin. Most of us stop there, but there's more. And we will also take a look at the scriptures which tell us about it. Sanctification is the present tense. We are being saved from the power of sin day by day by yielding to the indwelling Holy Spirit. And glorification is the future tense, which we which will take place at rapture. We will be saved from the very presence of sin. Does the scripture support all this? Let's take a look at scriptures which imply to us that there are three different tenses of salvation. The past tense. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. This is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Romans 8 24. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one hope for what he sees? For the present tense, we have 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. For we are to gather the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And the future tense, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So let's talk a little about the present tense, sanctification. We get to know from various places across the scripture that the Holy Spirit indwells every true believer. We see that in Romans chapter 8 also. And why is he there? 1 John chapter 2 verse 6 tells us, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Can we do that by ourselves? All of us know the answer. But this is a scriptural mandate for every truly born again believer. And that is why the Holy Spirit is so very necessary. Every truly born again believer knows the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit, which tells us when we are knowingly displeasing God. Yielding to the Spirit of God means listening to that still, small voice. Why is this so important? Because that is keeping us from getting into our flesh and doing what God doesn't want us to do. And thus it is helping us to become more and more like our Lord which is the entire goal of the Christian life. We see across the scriptures many instructions that God gives us, which today we often call legalism, but actually it all happens as we yield to the Spirit of God. And here in John chapter 17, verse 17, we see that sanctification happens through the Word of God. What does that mean? That means that we need the Word of God, that when we read the Word of God and let the Spirit of God unfold it to us, we understand just what God expects of us. And then the Holy Spirit helps us to live that life by transforming us bit by bit to make us more Christ-like. And that is why the Spirit of God and the Word of God are inseparable. So the next thing we need to understand is the Word of God. If this is what we are sanctified by, then we have to know about its significance. So the Word of God. Today in the Bible is something we don't talk or hear much about. The word of God, however, is the ultimate truth. 
But how can we know that the Bible is true? It doesn't at all look like that. Why? Because when we are reading it with a fleshly perspective, it is full of the most strange story. But the Bible isn't a storybook. It is the word of God. And everything it says is completely true. But how can we be sure that it is really true? And what is the difference between it and some other book? The first way we can know the difference between the word of God and any other book is because what the word because what the God of the word says happens. In no other religion can any idol fulfill what he says. What he says will not happen or come to pass. And today it is unfortunate to see that even the majority of Christians are following their own picture of God, not as the scripture describes. But when we ask the spirit of God to open the scriptures to us, laying aside all our thoughts and ideas, we will see it coming alive in us. For example, if the Bible says, do this and you will be blessed. When we sincerely follow the instruction diligently, we will be blessed beyond our comprehension. And this blessing is not our fleshly view of the word blessing. It is God's blessing, not our fleshly desire. Furthermore, the Bible is different from every other book because you can read it over and over again and still not know everything. For any other book, once you read something and learn it, that's it. You can't keep going back to that same passage and learn something new every time. That just doesn't happen. But when we open our Bibles with a word of prayer, asking the Spirit of God to open it to us, we can keep going back to a certain passage over and over and over again. Any passage. And every time we will learn something new. Why can't any other book do this? Because only the Bible is the word of God. All scripture and only the scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible isn't a book of history, theology, or some other kind of study. It contains those, but it is not that. The scripture is for the purpose of showing us who God is and how he wants us to live. And it sanctifies us because it shows us the places we need to pray that God would help us be more like Christ. And the Holy Spirit will activate that in us as we yield to him day by day. Today as we end, let us remember that sanctification is the will of God for us. As we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3. And the reason why God has saved us as we see in Romans chapter 8 verse 29. Let us yield to the Spirit of God today. And before we end today, here are a few questions for us to examine ourselves. Number one, what is John chapter 17 about? Number two, what is the point of verse 17? Number three, what is sanctification? Is it for every true believer or only some? And is it optional? Number four, are the Holy Spirit and the Word of God separable? Why or why not? And number five, what did Lord Jesus Christ mean when he said, Sanctify them by your truth. Lord Jesus Christ is coming extremely soon. Today let us be in his presence and trust in him. And today let us fight the good fight, keep up the faith and finish this race strong. Thank you everybody for viewing us and may Lord Jesus Christ bless you all in abundance. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again. Thank you so much, Anna, for reminding us and talking about sanctification, dear brothers and sisters. This was Messiah's prayer moments before death. He is praying for the disciples, for the believers who is a, who will be believing. That's you and me for true born again believers. Moments before death, this is the wish of a person who is dying. What is it? Father, oh, holy father, sanctify them. By thy truth. What is the truth? The next phrase tells us. Thy word is truth. How can we be sanctified? By his word. What does that mean? That means what Peter was telling us in 1 Peter 1.23. Dear brothers and sisters. Peter told us what? Having been born again. 1 Peter 1.23. And let us once again. If you, if you have your Bibles opened up. And then let us turn to 1 Peter 1.23. And if you have not, let us together, if you would please, turn your Bibles, open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 says, 
having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. We probably don't get to hear that we are born again through the word of God. We have no understanding about that we are born again through the word of God. What does exactly that mean? That we are born again through the word of God. What exactly that means? Because I thought it's just what we are hearing. The smartphone single tap salvation. Everything else is probably a lie. That's what I heard. But the word of God is telling that we are born again also by the word of God. So that brings us to what Anna was telling. And we have shared that in past in detail. When Lord let us, if you have any questions, please say, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our contact will be in the description box as well as a comment section is open. That is what we are not understanding. Justification, sanctification, as well as glorification. As Anna shared the scriptures with us, they walk hand in hand. They walk hand in hand. If we don't understand that. Satan has deceived us. We will be deceived. We will be sold out to the line of the enemy. And perhaps, perhaps there is an idol sitting in my heart. Which wants to gratify my flesh. And Satan will find ways, find ways to minister to that idol which is sitting in my heart. All these are very hard to hear, dear brothers and sisters. But these are the... Things which the Spirit of God convicts us of. And today we will take a look at it. So Peter basically is telling us once again. Having been born again not of corruptible seed. But incorruptible through the word of God. So And Messiah is telling John 17, 17. Father sanctify them. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So sanctification through the word of God. Is what Peter is referring to once again. So sanctification as Anna gave us the reference, 1 Corinthians 1.18, we see what we are being saved. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, those, but to us who are being saved. What does it sound like? It is present perfect continuous tense. Who are being saved? That is sanctification. Who are being saved? Once again, dear brothers and sisters, these theological terminologies, they can confuse us. So if you have any questions, please, please, once again, don't hesitate to contact us. But more than that, let us be active beings. Please take it to your prayer closet. Let the Spirit of God, let the Spirit of God teach you. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to you the whole counsel of God. Let us dig deeper in the Word of God. What does it mean to be born again by the Word of God? That's what Peter is telling. What exactly it is? What is Messiah telling about? Sanctify them, sanctify them by thy truth. So that's the sanctification happens. One mode of sanctification is, of course, through the word. As we read the word of God, the spirit of God unfolds, us for, unfolds it for us. And Romans 8.29 is brought to fruition moment by moment as we yield to the spirit of God. God does not justify anybody whom he will not sanctify. Then Messiah's prayer is for when? Then Messiah prayed for Wayne. God does not justify anybody whom he will not sanctify because Messiah's specific request is Father, O Holy Father, sanctify them. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So let us understand that, that sanctification once again is not for the super committed. Sanctification is a part of once again, regeneration is both sanctification is growth. If we are truly regenerated, if we are a true born again believer, once again, we will be, if there is true regeneration through the precious, priceless, holy blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, if we have bowed down to the cross truly, if we truly are transformed by the power of the cross of Calvary, which only the cross of Calvary offers, because we truly understand if there would have been any other way, dear brothers and sisters, then Messiah's prayer in Gethsemane is in vain once again. Why? Oh, Holy Father, if there is any other way, then let this cup pass from me. It did not. That means Messiah is the only way, dear brothers and sisters. There is no other way. The cross of Calvary is the only way. That is the narrow path. There is no other way. 
And if we are truly regenerated by the power of the cross of Calvary through the precious, priceless, holy blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, then the Spirit of God indwells the indwelling Holy Spirit, makes us more holy, not evil. That is sanctification. That is sanctification. Dear brothers and sisters, last time we are... In 1st Peter, and last time I do apologize, I guess, as all over the place, as Lord was leading us, we talked about when David shared the origin word last time. So we talked about so many different things. Once again, the Spirit of God led us. So today we will pick up on that. We will try to once again understand from the scripture what exactly is regeneration because once again, dear brothers and sisters, sanctification is a consistent concept. Sanctification is also necessary for our witnessing. How 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 which we have been dwelling on and hopefully we will have something out of it about regeneration and mostly, most importantly sanctification. Peter says, what? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. There is a whole lot going on. We need to let the Spirit of God unfold it, break it down for us so that we can ruminate, we can meditate on the Scripture. His Word is truth. It will sanctify us as we let the Spirit of God, the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, sanctify us. If we rush through it, we won't even understand. Let's take a pause, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's where we are because this is our most important preemptive stewardship. To sanctify, sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. To Our hearts must be separated unto Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. He wants an undivided heart. No matter who tells you what, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Lord Jesus Christ wants an undivided heart. We can go through all the 31,102, I believe, verses. And it will point to that same fact that Lord Jesus Christ, we serve a zealous God. Messiah himself demonstrated that, that the zeal, the zeal for thine house has eaten me up. The reproaches that reproached thee has fallen on me. Today we don't want to have the reproaches coming from the hating world. We, want, we don't want to have that reproaches which our flesh every day is trying to make us go, go gratify your flesh. The reproaches which reproached thee are evil, evil in our Dwelling in our sin. Today we want to do that. We don't have a zeal. Zeal to pursue. Lord Jesus Christ. A compassion. A compassion for Christ. And Christ alone. These are not mere words. A lifestyle. Christ is a lifestyle. Put on the new man Paul says. Put on the new man. Are we? Putting on the new man is not delusional. It shows up. Sanctification is not delusional. Theological concept where somebody comes in front of the camera and talks so many different things which is ministering the idol of gratifying our flesh which is in our heart and we feel good about it. That's a lie from the pit of hell if any message is not convicting me. Convicting me because every day there are tens and thousands of ways which we displease God and that doesn't mean that oh well what there are so many ways. There are millions of ways to displease God, then why, why bother to why bother to ask for forgiveness? Because I don't even know. Let's keep on continuing. That's why Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 was written, dear brothers and sisters. Sanctification. Sanctification is our preemptive, is our most important preemptive stewardship because the Bible tells us. So we were in. Let's before we. I digress again. Let's jump in today. Let us understand. We will see a few scriptures to understand regeneration. A little bit about regeneration. The first five verses, that's what we were doing. What exactly is regeneration? What has God saved me from? What has God saved me from? I don't even know. Today it is preached. I don't know the disease, but we are hearing the cure. Somebody is always preaching about the cure, but I don't know about the disease. Or what, what is the disease again? I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm taking this medication about. I don't have any idea. But well, I can, I can just lift up my hands and say, "Hey, I'm cured. Hey, I'm cured." But I don't even know what. 
what I was suffering from. And that, once again, I'm, it's a clumsy example, dear brothers and sisters, or clumsy way to put it. And once again, that's what, dear brothers and sisters, we need to understand. That's regeneration is something that we won't be able to go through all of it. Perhaps then we will be, a rapture will come sooner, dear brothers and sisters. And truly, 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 this is not being facetious. Truly, we are telling that rapture will come sooner if we try to understand regeneration through the scriptures because it is embedded all across the scriptures, all across the scriptures, as a matter of fact. If we try to understand the concept of redemption, how much of the Bible talks about redemption? We think about creation when we look at the heavens, declare his glory, staggering, indeed staggering, indeed staggering. How much of the Bible is accounted for the creation account? We see a few chapters in Genesis, few chapters in book of Psalms, few chapters in Isaiah, a glimpse in the book of Job. Pretty much that. That's pretty much it. About, we can say 15 to 15% of the Bible at the max. But when we come to the thought about regeneration, about redemption, book of Genesis, does it talk about it? Book of Exodus, talk about it. Book of Numbers, does it talk about it? Book of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, what does it? The entire Torah. Then let's go from major prophets to minor prophets. To the book, the books of in the history. Does it talk about it? The entire New Testament. Does it talk about it, dear brothers and sisters? If we try to take a look at it, about 80 to 85 percent of the Bible is dedicated to redemption. So this is just the volume wise. Volume wise, we are seeing what is what is so much important. Or how much of that portion of the of that topic of redemption is dedicated to redemption and creation. This is not to tell which is more important. This is to tell how much God has emphasized on it. What did creation cost God? His breath? His words? Spoken words? What did redemption? What did redemption cost? What was the cost of redemption for our Heavenly Father, for our God? One true living God, Yeshua HaMashiach, his son. His son was the cause, dear brothers and sisters. When we look at the cross every time, it should remind us, it should remind us how heinous, how heinous is our sin. I killed him on that cross. I was the one. I am the man. I am the man. We are the man. We put him on that cross. Not the Roman soldiers, not the Jews, not the Pharisees. But I put him on that cross. It's my sin. So heinous I am. Oh, the wretched man that I am. So heinous are the effects of my sin. That I have killed him. First degree murder. We all are murderers. We don't realize that. We truly don't realize that. I am the man. We all are the man. When Nathan pointed to David, oh, you are the man. Yes, I am the man. Who killed Christ. We can all pretend this and that. Or we can come to the conclusion. It's all Lord Jesus Christ. And I am the man. I am the man who killed him. I am the man. We all are. So heinous. So heinous are the effects of our sin. But Lord Jesus Christ. His mercy. His love. I stand speechless. I don't have any words, dear brothers and sisters. We don't have any words to describe that love. Behold what manner of love that the Father has bestowed on us. That now we are called the children of God. Why? To trample the grace of God. That's where we are. So heinous is our sin. So sinful we are. We want to put crucify him every single day. But I don't want to say that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ. Christ lives in me. Now the life I live is by faith in Son of God who loved me and died for me. I am not ready to do that. I am going to win debates and I'm going to crucify. Put Christ to open shame. Put Christ to open shame and talk about all this evil. So heinous. I am the man. I am the man who put him there on that cross. Do we realize that, dear brothers and sisters today? Do we realize that? That we are the man. I am the man. It doesn't sound good. But it brings us definitely to our knees and prostrate in front of the cross when we look at the cross. 
At the cross, everything changed. Everything changed. A filth like me can talk about God. Everything changed at the cross. What has changed in your life? We will so look forward to hear in the comment section, dear brothers and sisters. Please share with us. Please share with us if you are listening to this. What has the cross, how has the cross changed you? Let us rise up for such a time as this when the cross has been trampled. Let us rise up and talk about how the cross has changed our lives. Not a one tap smartphone salvation technology, but it has changed me inside out. It has changed you inside out. And you are in awe. Oh, how could it be God? How could it be? How could it be possible? So that's redemption, dear brothers and sisters. I am the man. That is redemption. I am the man who killed Christ. We are responsible for his death. No one else. And why? My sin. How heinous is my sin? Our prayer should be, Lord, teach me to hate my sin and my flesh. As you hate sin, Lord. Every single day. We cannot do it. We cannot do it without his power, dear brothers and sisters. We cannot make it every single breath without his power. Lord Jesus Christ was not being facetious when he said, Abide in me. Without me, you can do nothing. We can start proving points here. Once again, I take a bottle of water and open the cap and say, Hey, I did it without Lord Jesus Christ. Kick the soccer ball and say, Hey, I did it without Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, I'm in physicians, dear brothers and sisters, but we cannot do it. We cannot make it. We need him every breath, every minute, every second, every femtosecond of our lives. We cannot make it. It's an evil world, not only evil world, not only the devil is evil, but our own flesh is there to destroy us. Our own people, so-called family, friends, whoever are there to destroy us. If they are not truly born again, they're there to destroy us. That's what the Bible tells us. Please go back and read Psalm 5. Please go back and read Psalm 7 out of all the Psalms. As a matter of fact, all across the book of Psalms, that's the concept. King David was chased by his own. By his own friends, by his own family, by his own son. But hands down he took it. I am the man. He took it, yes. Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 tells us the man after God's own heart. Tells us. What is that man? He is not a sin. He is not a man without sin. Heinous sin. It's terrible sin. Worse than Saul also. But he's a man after God's own heart. Why? Because when Nathan said, you are the man. Hands down, he never spoke another word. He never defended his sin. He never pointed to the cross of Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, Psalm 22 King David wrote Psalm 22. Did he have any idea about redemption? Did he have any idea about Lord Jesus Christ? The brothers and sisters, King David, when he talks about blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, Psalm 32. Did he, did he have any idea or are we, are we thinking that he was saved through the law? Then we are thinking delusional, we are deceived. Everybody, whoever has been saved, has been saved by the grace and grace of God alone. He knew, but he did not point to this and that. He said, yes, I am the man. Yes, I am the man. Today is the day to rise up and say, yes, I am the man who killed him. I am the man who killed my God, my Lord, my Savior. I am the man. Are we ready to confess that, dear brothers and sisters? That's the question. That's the question today. So before, so that's about redemption once again. And creation so we will try to pick up on Ephesians chapter 2 understand about redemption uh, understand about regeneration regeneration as the Bible tells that today we truly don't understand dear brothers and sisters that what has God saved me from what is the big deal what did why did I need to get saved what, what is this big deal about today we don't understand the heinous effects of this one tap, smartphone, single tap salvation. We don't understand because we don't know the disease. Any cure is okay. It's we are talking about and 
I usually don't give give these, these examples, but let's say we are talking about a hint of autoimmune disease or something as dangerous as the demonic as cancer, and then we are telling, well, I can, I can, you know, what well, I can take this uh, uh, painkiller. I, I can take this. Oh, this, this is blocking this uh, cyclooxygenous pathway. It's, it's great. Uh, it will be okay, and we will have some fancy terminologies there. The doctor can say, all right, you know what, the prostaglandins, how they're, how the prostaglandins are being created here. We have to block one of the enzymes that there are, we have these cyclooxygenous one and cyclooxygenous two, and these are the paths will be blocked. It's delusional. The doctor is talking about a painkiller. It's called this COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitor, cyclooxygenous 1 and 2 inhibitor. It's delusional. We don't go and treat for cancer. Listening to doctors like that is delusional, dear brothers and sisters. It's dangerous. It's demonic. That's where we need to understand. That's where we need to understand the disease as the Bible tells us. That is so very crucial. So let's jump in. We, as a matter of fact, started that and once again... I do keep digressing, dear brothers and sisters, I do apologize. Hopefully we are, the Spirit of God is speaking to our hearts. And that's for each one of us, including me and my family, dear brothers and sisters. So we did look at Ephesians chapter 2, first three verses. We will take a look at first five verses. Let's read through that together. If you would please turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. First five verses, let's just read through it and let the Spirit of God speak to us. Let's just read through it and let the Spirit of God speak to us. Book of Ephesians is a staggering book, dear brothers and sisters. First chapter itself covers topics about election, predestination, redemption, adoption, the will of God, the 12 mysteries, dispensations, forgiveness, inheritance, and the sealing. And this is just chapter 1. This is just chapter 1. As a matter of fact, when we see Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14, we will see in Greek it is one sentence and it traces God's activity in salvation from eternity past through time through eternity future, including the mystery of God's will, which was previously undisclosed. So we see that in the first 14 verses, as a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14, we see that. And after looking into first three chapters, the book of Ephesians is doctrinal and Chapters 4, 5, 6 is practical, dear brothers and sisters. We talked about it, but today let's jump into Ephesians chapter 2. Let's read together. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1 says, and you, that is me, that is you, that is each one of us, and you, every true born again believer, and you, he made alive. Wait a minute, he says you made alive? Was I dead? Was Why was I dead? What was I dead to? There lies the answer, dear brothers and sisters. Let today be the day to understand why am I saved? More importantly, what am I saved from? Let today be the day. Let today be the fresh new revelation if it has not been previously revealed by the Spirit of God. Let today the Spirit of God talk to you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, what am I saved from? We are looking at the cure, the smartphone single tap salvation, and I'm very convinced with it. But let's see whether, what is my disease? I am just trying to take an antibiotic or a painkiller with the fancy terminologies and things like that. Well, you know, this is that. This is a gram negative bacteria. This is a gram positive. This is targeting the pro protein synthesis of the, of the organism. This is that bacteria. This is a wrong or whatever we are talking about. And these all sounds fancy when the doctor will talk, but really, what is the disease? Does it have anything to do with infection? Does it have, and they, these are, once again, this is perhaps a clumsy example, but what we are trying to get at, dear brothers and sisters, is sometimes we hear fancy theological terms, terms and it kinds of resonance in us, then there is a form of godliness and we take it because perhaps there is an idol sitting in our heart to gratify our flesh. And those messages are gratifying our flesh. We feel it good. That's demonic. That's demonic. That's what Christ died for to set us free from that. And that's what Ephesians 2 chapter 1 through 5. Let's see what God has for us. Hopefully we can go through these five verses. And it will be a life changing experience if we let God work. Dear brothers and sisters. 
and you he made alive. So one thing I understand, I was dead. So what was I dead to? Is Paul telling us that? Let's continue. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So I was dead in trespasses and sins. So that should tell us first and foremost, dear brothers and sisters, all the evil diversion talk about legalism and everything. It ends there. A dead person cannot do anything to be alive. Period. End of the story. Period. End of the story. We never talk about the grace of God being turned into lewdness. That is the end time marker, not grace of God being turned into legalism. That's not the end time marker. Please go and please dig deeper in the scriptures. Book of Jude. Book of Jude first. Uh, it has only one chapter, verses 3 and 4 tells us to contend for our faith, not for legalism, but the grace of God being turned into lewdness. We are getting into a delusional, demonic, deceptive times. Damnable heresies are being propagated. It is propagating faster than the speed of light. 186,000 miles per second. That's the speed of light. What if we remember from our... High school, but of course now they have come up with all the the speed of light, the, which was C, I guess, and it's still changing, and it's constantly changing. It seems these days, but let's not get into that again. So yeah, what is this? What I was dead, so a dead person cannot do anything, cannot do anything about works, this and that, to be alive. You, he made alive, so he has made us alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. So if I'm truly alive, then I won't be dead in trespasses and sins, right? Here is the key, dear brothers and sisters. Here is the twisting key once again. What is death? The definition of death, we think it is extinction. It is not. When we are made alive, it doesn't mean that we are perfect now. We, have, we are sinless. No, death, the definition of death is not extinction. So it is not talking about that when we will be alive, there will be extinction of sins. The definition of death is separation. Separation. What does that mean? We are, when we see, when we see, dear brothers and sisters, physical death is a separation of the soul from the body. James 2.26 tells us that. Spiritual death is what? It is alienated from the life of God. It's an eternal separation. If I believe Ephesians 4, 18 and 19 tells us, then the book of Revelation talks about the second death in chapter 20. I believe that's verses 6 and 14. So we have to understand the unbeliever is dead. Unbeliever is dead. That's the most important point. He does not need resuscitation. He needs resurrection. That's the key to understand. So I was dead. He made me alive. What was I dead, dead to? That's the crucial key to understand. Trespasses and sins. So will I be still, if he has truly made me alive, I will be still dead in sins, practicing sins, trespasses and sins. And these vocabularies, once again, is good to go and take a look. Transgression, trespasses, sin, iniquity, dear brothers and sisters. This will tell us. Precision is the key in these end moments because that's how the word of God will be twisted. God told us, be ye not deceived, do not be deceived. So, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses. And Paul continues, and let us look at the past tense as he is talking now. So he is telling that we were dead in our trespasses. Messiah has made us alive. And what were the trespasses? That also he's telling. I mean, how clear can it get? How Gracious our God is that what we were is giving a profile. A profile of our heinous filth. We can still want to assert and take some Bible verses out of, out of context. Whenever a scripture is taken out of context, a text out of context is always with context, always becomes a pretext. When we do all these things, we try to justify that no, we will. We are trying to redefine the Bible. We are trying to open the canon. We are trying to redefine the word death now. Death is what? Is not extinction, is a separation. Now we are dead to sins, doesn't mean in Romans 6 when we will probably, when we talk about the sanctification a little more, we will take a look at it. 
their dead to sins doesn't mean that our sins are going to be extinct. We, it will be sinless. No, it's a sep we are separated from sins. And what were those sins? That's what Paul will tell us. This is our before we were born again. What did our resume look like? That's what Paul is telling us. And it should look like it should be exactly opposite of that now. But that doesn't happen in one day from that filthy resume to go to that spiritual resume, which God wants. Romans 8, 29 is the sanctification process. It's a progressive process day by day. We are being sanctified as we yield to the spirit of God. If anybody is telling anything else, please do check it out. Dear brothers and sisters, Lee, read the Whole counsel, let the whole counsel of scriptures guide you and only let the spirit of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of the one true living God guide you and teach you. Not me, not Anna, not David, not this channel, nor any pastor, preacher, Bible scholar, whoever it is, but not an apologetic, nobody, but only the spirit of God. Let the spirit of God teach you. So. Paul is very clear. He says that we are made alive. God has made us alive through the precious, priceless, holy blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We are made alive. Why? Because we were dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We, a dead person cannot do anything, period. There is no question of works and legalism. It should be a period there. But now we have to, it, Paul doesn't stop there. He is now giving us the resume how it looked like. And the important thing is to notice on the past tense, in verses 2 and 3, Paul is telling now, in which you once walked. So we are not daily walking in willful sin now. We are alive. We are not dead. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. And once again, dear brothers and sisters, this is never an effort of the flesh. It is all we are talking about. The sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Please let us not get lost. Please all the deception. All the demonic and destructive heresies and doctrines. Please let it not take you away from Lord Jesus Christ. From his message. A consistent message. Father sanctify them. Sanctify them by thy truth. And this is what we are talking about. All the Bible talks about that. The Bible is an integrated message system. It is a supernatural message comes from our outside our space and time, the dimension of our space and time. And it is an integrated message. These two discoveries, if we find out in the Bible, it will change our lives forever. And truly the sanctification process will, as, as we yield, we will understand that much more in reality rather than delusional. So now let's take a look at our resume, which is terrible. Of course, before he made us alive. What is it? In which you once walked. What what was what were those sins and trespasses? So here one thing is clear. God has saved us from sins. Let nobody sell that to you, dear brothers and sisters. Please do your own study. Please be an active Berean. What are we saved from? Our sins, our tres trespasses. We were dead in it. He had made us alive. What am I saved from is very important. That is what Paul is telling us. And what are those sins now? In which you once walked according to the course of this world. So being worldly. We were worldly. We were lovers of the world. John 17. That's what Anna was stressing. That Messiah. The line is drawn as clear as it is. That we don't belong to this world. If we don't belong to this world. My life should show it. It's not once again delusional. Dear brothers and sisters. So in which you once walked according to the course of this world. So the world will direct our steps, our course, our desires. Satan will put worldly enticements and try to entice us. Worldly things and try to allure us. Is that how I live today? If it is, then there is hope. There is hope for a true born again believer. The cross of Calvary will set you free. That's what the cross of Calvary offers. It's not delusional. We can tell it, dear brothers and sisters, experientially and the, on the authority of the word of God. Wherever you are today, it's not about being perfect. Never ever. The Bible is not. The Bible is filled with sinful people whom God has started a good work in each one of them to sanctify them. It's not about people who uses, who tramples on the grace of God. 
That's what God abhors all through the Old Testament. That's what we understand, dear brothers and sisters. So let's not get that confused. So in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, and the spirit, the satanic demonic spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. If we don't want to obey God, then we are filled with the demonic spirit of disobedience. I am dead to sins. I am not made alive. Verses 1 and 2, we can do our own math and corollary of that should tell us that yes, I am not saved. Period. Dear brothers and sisters, please do your own math. Please come to your own conclusions. Please be, if we are having the logical flow everywhere, why not in the scriptures? And you, he made alive. You were dead in, our, you were dead in trespasses. All these are in past tenses now. You were dead in trespasses in which you once walked. According to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now works in the sons of disobedience. Dear brothers and sisters, it's not about perfection of perfect obedience. It's about the will to be obedient. God knows our heart. If we willfully, willfully we are preaching disobedience. That obedience is never a requirement, never a factor, all the whatever that is. If we are willfully looking into those options. Why do I need to look into the loopholes in the word of God to commit sin? Is that, as, is that a resume for a true born again believer? It's not about being perfection. It's about looking in the loopholes in the scripture so that I can stay in my sin and justify that. Then how can I, how did I understand the power of the cross? How did I experience it? First hand it. I need to truly experience that power of Christ then. So in which you once walked according to the course, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So that's the spirit of the prince of the power of the air, which is the Satan himself. That spirit, the demonic satanic spirit is working in the sons of disobedience who wants to disobey the word of God. That's what Paul is telling that's something, dear brothers and sisters, these are strong, strong messages. Bible is all about convicting us. Bible is all about telling that I killed my Christ. I am the man. I killed him. He has made me alive. I don't want to kill him every single day, but I want to crucify. Crucify my flesh. Deny my flesh. Pick up my cross. Crucify, for I have been crucified with Christ. When we talk about the thief on the cross, he was crucified. Am I crucified with Christ? Am I truly crucified with Christ? Or is it just a, just a talking point for a debate, for contention? And Proverbs says that all this debate, contention comes, Proverbs 13, 10. Dear brothers and sisters, please do take a look at it. This comes out of pride. I have done nothing, dear brothers and sisters. Where do I get the audacity? Where do I get the audacity to condemn others? And once again, dear brothers and sisters, this channel is never, ever about condemning others. It's time we pray so, so that God can work in every single person because God himself doesn't want anyone to perish. That is his heart. That's the heart of Lord Jesus Christ. Today we need to pray, pray, pray and pray, dear brothers and sisters, for what is happening. Mere words can do nothing. My word, your word, our words doesn't have power, but his word has. So let his will be accomplished, dear brothers and sisters. We need to pray, pray and pray. And then Paul continues to verse 3. Hopefully today we'll be able to Go till verse 5, we'll see. So Paul says now, among whom also we, and Paul is talking we here. He is including himself. We all once conducted ourselves. This is all in past tense. This is all in past tense. And it is not delusional. Paul's life was not delusional. When we talk about he was... An excellent student, perhaps today he will be one of the brilliant, brilliant, brilliant mind who walked planet Earth. Today he would have been perhaps 
given nine or more than nine or ten Nobel prizes for whatever whatever field may, may be math, literature, science, whatever it is, medicine, whatever he would have been gotten all of them, all 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 six, all six or seven of them. He was a brilliant mind. He walked. He understood. But then he had Acts chapter nine, the turning point. The road to Damascus changes everybody. Shaul, Shaul, why art thou persecuted me? Paul says what? Who are you, Lord? Three days. After three days, he sees Hanania. Hanania means grace of God. The grace of God after three days. That's again a three days for our mystic friends, dear brothers and sisters. That's again a reference of three days when we talk about three days uh, that when we talk about the gospel that he died according to the scriptures he was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures where are those three days what are the where all it we find in scriptures that's what so this is one of the subtle subtle references once again whatever we are looking at here brothers and sisters the truth is we are whatever is driving us it should drive us to Christ it is this unbroken triad if you're looking at numerology or signs or wonders or, or or mysticism whatever the chances are it will take us away from Christ the chances are very high it will take us away from Christ so it should if we are talking about signs of times we see the sons of Issachar believe that first chronicle chapter 12 the sons of Issachar he they knew about the signs of times that should draw us to be active Berians, Acts 17, 11, to dig deeper in the scriptures, to receive with an open mind and let the spirit of God talk to us, sanctify us and understand what God is wanting out of us. Because 1 John 3, 3 tells us what he who has the hope of rapture purifies himself as he is pure. And that's what the sanctification work of God. And when we see that, when the signs and wonders should make us like active Berians and the triad, the third step is of fellowship first john chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 as we saw fellowship with our heavenly father with our messiah in spirit and in truth that's what it should draw us to dear brothers and sisters that's what all it is about it is an unbroken unidirectional triad wherever we start whatever draws us to christ it should draw make us acts 17 11 that's the second step in this unidirectional unbroken triad and the third step is a fellowship with our heavenly father and with messiah in spirit and in truth which fills us in his presence there is fullness of joy when he fills us with joy that joy spills over to our dear fellow brethren when we love the lord god almighty with all our heart strength mind and soul then he fills us with his love and that love overflows to our fellow brethren we in and of ourselves we cannot love that's not about our love Love is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not my work, our work. So Paul says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. So Paul has this Damascus Road experience and there is no delusional change. There is no delusional change. He is truly changed. We see this is the man who was a student of Gamaliel, brilliant mind, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and then he becomes... A true born again believer. A staggering, staggering. If we see his spiritual resume, it's just staggering. If when we see his resume from Acts 9 onwards, it's just staggering, dear brothers and sisters. It's just staggering. So there is no delusional, only talking salvation. There is not. To follow him, what shall we do? Messiah says what? John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And how do we follow him? Luke 9, 23. To follow him, we deny our flesh. We pick up our cross daily and follow him. These are words which is spoken by God himself. Rightly dividing is this is not pizza. We chop it off everything and take a millionth of a portion that's not how it works dear brothers and sisters and once again i'm being facetious but hopefully we can put the point across so paul says let's wrap it up with verse three we'll pick it up with but god moment which was four says a staggering staggering phrase in itself so verse three says among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh 
fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as others that tells us dear brothers and sisters so first of all we were dead in our trespasses and this is a complete diagnosis as in Romans 1 2 and 3 this is the profile profile of that diagnostic profile of our sins what were those sins which we were dead and now we are alive so we behave differently dead and alive are antagonistic they are at two ends opposite ends of the spectrum we are there is no middle ground here and that's the process that's the process of sanctification that is what the bible is all, all true bible talks about father sanctify them by thy word that's what Messiah is telling. Sanctification is God's will for every true born again believer. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. Are we taking it seriously? That is God's will. So among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. So the profile, if we see to wrap up, let's take a quick look at the profile. So once in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, and the spirit who now works, the satanic spirit, which works in the sons of disobedience. So disobedience is intrinsically a satanic, demonic spirit, which Paul is telling us. And then he says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. We once conducted, today are we knowingly and willingly want to conduct and use grace and say that I am a wretched man I will be staying in that sin Paul is not telling us that dear brothers and sisters among whom also we all once 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 conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind so the, this in itself is once again to unfold, let the Spirit of God unfold that there is a message there itself that what does it mean? The desires of the flesh and of the mind. So our mind has certain desires. Our flesh has certain desires. Our mind as soon as we see that notification, I know that rapture date. I have cracked it. What does it say? First thing. What is the desire of my mind? No, let me shun it. Let us be honest once again, dear brothers and sisters. We know the honest answer. That's the desire of the mind. And that's just one example. That's just a starting point. And if the Lord leads you, please do a study on the desires of the flesh and of the mind. In the scriptures, it will be a staggering study in itself. The desires of the mind and desires of the flesh in which we once walked. So we need to understand what are the desires of the flesh? What are the desires of the mind in which we once walked so that we don't keep on falling in that trap? Satan comes as an angel of light, masquerades as an angel of light. With the cunning craftiness, he deceives us. If we don't know what is the desire of the flesh, desires of the mind, we are there to be. For sure we will be deceived. And were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Why were we children of wrath again? Because we were dead in our trespasses. And exactly what? Lord Jesus Christ died for. That is exactly the cross of Calvary offers us. We need to understand today, dear brothers and sisters, what is this disease? What is the heinous, the heinous, how heinous is my sin that I have killed Christ? And how heinous is it? It's verse 2 and 3, Ephesians chapter 2. Before going to verses 8 and 9, let us do ourselves a favor, dear brothers and sisters. Let us read those four, seven verses. And let us read verse 10 as well to understand. This is not something which we hear, but this is very crucial and important. And hopefully next time we will pick up. So today we saw and you he made alive. You were dead in trespasses. So why the need for regeneration? Why what were what we were in? That was in verses 2 and 3. And next time we will pick it up, learn more about the regeneration aspect. What God has exactly done in verses 4 and 5. What God has exactly done. And from there as the Spirit of God leaves, we will learn a little more about sanctification. So hopefully bear with us dear brothers and sisters. Probably we are taking a longer time in 1 Peter 3, 3.15. We are taking a longer than usual, but God has a message for us. So 
regeneration is birth, sanctification is growth. So we saw why exactly we needed regeneration. We were dead in certain things and God made us alive. And then we will see next time what God has made us alive to. So that is very crucial and very important once again to understand the regeneration and sanctification. And we thank you once again. Dear brothers and sisters, we are truly running out of time. We thank you once again for viewing us, for being once again, dear brothers and sisters, for being a part of our eternal family unified by His Spirit and His Spirit alone. It's not our like-mindedness. We thank you so very much, all our dear fellow brethren, for praying for me and my family, dear brothers and sisters. We so do look forward once again to hear from all of you. And if you have heard, please do leave a comment on how the cross has transformed your life. We that's a testimony of Lord Jesus Christ, of witnessing Christ, how Christ has transformed your life. We so do look forward to hear from each and every single of our dear fellow brethren. Let, let us once again exalt Him, glorify Him, honor Him, receive that power every single day constantly. The power of the cross of Calvary which transforms us, sanctifies us through His word and if you have any prayer requests please don't hesitate to contact us dear brothers and sisters we are truly praying for indeed indeed for each and every single of our fellow brethren who have asked for prayers so that messiah's mighty will and only his perfect will be accomplished through each one of you so that he can empower you with his empowering grace to finish this race strong we thank you so very much all of your fellow brethren and today let's end with a short word of prayer shall we anna yes all right you can please go ahead Lord Jesus, once again, I bring ourselves in your presence, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for once again reminding us that you are coming soon and extremely soon, Lord, to take us all home, Lord. And as we wait upon you, Lord, help us, Lord, to yield to your Holy Spirit, Lord. And bless us as we go forth from here and bless all our viewers, Lord. And help us, Lord, to glorify you in everything we do, Lord. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. We thank you once again, dear brothers and sisters. Messiah's return is upon us. Lord Jesus Christ can truly return any moment now. It can be tonight. It can be tomorrow. It can be a week from now or a month from now. But let us, let us, as Messiah said in today's word, be ye ready. Let us be ready for his return. Lord Jesus Christ is truly coming soon and very soon. His return is imminent. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters, and may God bless each and every one of you. Shalom.